Dracula chapter 8. So you have read the chapter and now we're just going to be going through it and doing some analysis. So just a reminder, we have Lucy returning from sleepwalking outside and she has a small wound on her neck. We have Dracula's boxes being moved to Carfax. We have Mina receiving news of that Jonathan is safe but uh, is suffering from mental illness and we have Renfield escaping the asylum but he is caught in the grounds of Carfax. So chapter 8 it begins with Mina Murray's journal. It's the day of the storm, that massive storm um, where the ship comes in and is manned by a dead captain and it is the 8th of August. So we've got a question that I think you need to be considering as we go through this chapter is to what extent Mina and Lucy could be regarded as embodying the early feminist ideals and we're going to as we go through this I'm going to look at the concept of the new woman and some feminism. So the 8th of August, Mina says, oh, but I am tired. If it were not that I had made my diary a duty, I should not open it tonight. So we get a sense from her tone that she is tired but satisfied. It's the idea that she's done something today that has been good. It's exhausting, but she's achieved something. And the fact that she says I had made I that it were had I made my diary a duty um, shows that she is very determined to write in her diary every day. She's very, very disciplined. She wants to be a female journalist and she realizes that in order to do so, she has to have the self-discipline and the practice and that's what her diary is for. So she makes time to write in it every single day. So what happened is that obviously Lucy um, is feeling a little bit better. So they go for a walk because remember the Victorian cure-all was go and get some fresh air. So they've gone for a walk and they've walked through a field and they've come across some cows and the cows gave have frightened the wits out of them. So I think it's quite interesting that this seems to imply that fear, and I when by fear I don't mean horror, terror, I mean being given a fright, can have a positive and restorative um power because they they had a laugh about it. They were walking across the field and and were given a fright by cows. So it's something that allows them to take their mind off the situation at present. They can focus on something else. So it has been somewhat restorative. Similarly, though, um, it is poignant a poignant contrast to the real fear, horror, and terror that has come. So to, is to come. So just a reminder. Stoker is just reminding us that um, the fear that is to follow is is far far greater. So as we look, see through this these next couple of episodes uh, with regards to Mina and Lucy, Mina looks after Lucy. She's clearly a very dutiful friend. One gets the impression that um, dis that despite their uh, friendship. They are very, very, very different women. They're polar opposites. I think this is partly due to their um, economic upbringing uh, they, and their economic status. Lucy clearly it comes from a family which has greater wealth than Mina's does. She doesn't have to work, whereas Mina does. Um, and we've noticed that there are other elements. For example, that she has a house in London and a house uh, in Whitby, etc., etc., OK, so we've got two very different women and they are spending time together. And Mina is obviously trying to look after her friend and she talks about all they got up to this day. So they had a really, really busy day. They went walking, they went for tea, etc., etc. And she says that she says, I believe we should have shocked the new woman with our appetites. So what she's saying is what they got up to today would have shocked the feminists, 
their appetites would have shocked them. Now, their appetites could be referenced to food and eating too much, or it could be re referenced to um, appetite for excitement or sexual appetites, anything along those lines. So that's again up to you. But she says that they would have shocked the new woman. So before we look at that, let's just go take a step back and explore what is new woman. Now, this is a term, I'm only going to go through it very briefly, by all means, do some additional research. Um, it will, because that will um, help you to understand where Stoke is coming from. So a new woman, the, the term new woman was first used in the early 1890s to describe um, late 19th century writing, which tackled issues to do with social change for women. So the issues that it would explore were things like getting better education, employment opportunities for women, the fact that there were double standards in terms of sex, the idea that a woman, uh, it, it questioned traditional attitudes towards marriage, motherhood, etc. So this is what the new woman looked at. They were looking at was early um, steps in terms of feminism. Remember, feminism is not man bashing or man hating. It's equal opportunities. So these women were trying to find equal opportunities and female emancipation. Um, again, shows how contemporary this novel was, because at the time, the new woman and the idea of the new woman was being very much mocked in the press. So Stoker has been very clever in, in incorporating this OK, and interestingly, he seems to have made we have Lucy and Mina, who are two separate characters, two very different characters, as we've explored already. Yet they both have some element of new woman in them. He hasn't given either of them, um, has made either of them a total new woman. He's just given them some attributes and aspects. Anyway, so Mina talks about how they've gone, all their appetites would shock new women. And she says, um, but men are more tolerant, bless them. So the implication seems to me that Mina seems to attribute or associate female emancipation and the idea of the new woman with intolerance. So maybe she's ahead of her time again, and she is highlighting that uh, female emancipation is being associated with man bashing, which is what it shouldn't be. So that would be intolerance. Okay, she says that um, they would uh, the female the, the, the new woman would have disapproved of their what they got up to so um, that day. So this is immediately contrasted, and the the, the 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 whole idea of tolerance and intolerance is immediately contrasted when Mina talks about how she had to be very very patient and tolerant with a curate who just would not leave. As you as you read further down that passage, so we've got this situation where um, Mina is is clearly herself a new woman, uh, or has element elements of it, but doesn't seem to categorise herself as one. Now we know that she's purposeful and she has ambition. We know that she's determined and she is self-disciplined, as we've seen from her writing in her diary. And in contrast, Lucy is this exuberant, impulsive, frivolous individual who doesn't seem to be have ambition to get employment. Her ambition, which one shouldn't judge, I suppose, is uh, the fact that she is her biggest concern is making an advantageous match, an ma advantageous marriage. So it just highlights again Stoker highlighting the contrasts between the two. Again, what is um, Mina's attitude towards new woman and feminism? Uh, it's quite interesting because she goes on to say that I suppose the new woman won't condescend in future to accept. She will do the proposing herself. So it's the idea that the new woman will be forward. They will usurp the role of men and they will um, do the asking. So it, it could be suggesting that um, when a woman finds her ultimate match she doesn't wait for him to ask her she asks him and she'll make a nice job of it now what i think is important to notice is that uh, her views on this are not really clear okay so does she think women should propose or not well i'm not sure it is very dependent on how you interpret the way she says things because when she says nice job is she being sarcastic or is she being positive? Because that'll change the meaning. 
Um, the fact that she finds consolation, some consolation in that, it, is not proof that she's anti um, new woman. So there's no evidence that she's for or against. Um, and I think Stoke is allowing us to make up our own mind. So he's what he's done with this passage in this series um, of, of Mina's telling of these events is to set up this mood of happiness and weary contentment and you know, so we, we've got this idea that they are, they've are they had a nice day. And and unfortunately, though, as soon as she begins to think of Jonathan, this becomes um, not, this is not the case. She, she, she does start to get a bit sad. So it's drawing, a, I think, a drawing our attention to the chaos that may follow. Um, clearly, Mina is beginning to emerge as a very strong, courageous woman. So my question to you is, to, do you think Stoker falls short in presenting her as independent or do you think he is successful? I will again let you, let you ruminate on that. So now we have a, a slight break and we have a change in the narrative and we move forward to the 11th of August at 3 a.m. And Lucy says... Diary again, no sleep now, so I may as well write. So what is she saying here? She's saying she's writing in her journal because she cannot sleep. This is really a bit of a weak excuse, as we discussed a little bit earlier. This is a woman who is determined, who's disciplined, um, who takes her writing seriously um, by saying, oh, I'm, I can't sleep, so I might as well write. It seems to be a bit of a, a cop out. It's, it's not in line with a character who's striving to be a lady journalist. So I think my criticism here is that Stoker seems to try and seems to have the impression that he needs to give or establish credibility of the authorship of each and every document included. As you remember, he wants us to believe all these documents. So he seems to keep needing to provide an excuse for why they're being written. Um, and I, in some cases, like this one, I think the links are a bit tenuous uh, because a, a journal's a journal. She could have just started with, I'm too agitated to sleep or we have had such an adventure. She didn't need to state no sleep now. Uh, on that note, the noun adventure um, suggests excitement and fun. And so as Mina's journal progresses, we begin to realise that her relationship with Lucy seems to be more than, more like mother and child rather than uh, two females of equal uh, age and intelligence. So perhaps, again, Stoker is trying to remind us and is trying to keep the differences between them at the forefront of the reader's mind, especially as we go through um, a little bit later with the sleepwalking incident. Okay, so... Mina discovers that um, Lucy is missing and she has gone out and uh, and she says she cannot be far. She's only in her nightdress. She can't find her. And she says there was no time to think of what might happen. A vague overmastering fear obscured all details. So. Just before we go into that last little statement, that last line, much much like the, uh, Dracula, Lucy has been locked to the house but manages to escape. So a lot like Jonathan and Dracula's castle, doors are locked and unlocked, uh, perhaps implying the power of Dracula that doors that are locked, suddenly Lucy has a way of getting through. Okay, right. So why is Mina so stressed and overcome by a vague overmastering fear? Well, Lucy is wandering around in her nightgown. Now, this is not a skimpy little negligee style nightgown. It's very likely to be um, the Victorian style of nightgown. So it will be from her neck to her wrists to her ankles. So we'll be covering everything. It will not be risque in any way. However, she is not dressed for outdoors. She probably and she will not have all the undergarments on that Victorian woman we expected to wear. So instead, she's wandering around in her nightshirt, which is something that is completely and utterly taboo. Victorian etiquette was extremely strict. 
In fact, this lovely quote says, although in England ladies enjoy far greater liberty of movement in public places than is permitted in continental society, it is not considered proper for unmarried women to frequent promenades and principal thoroughfares thronged with businessmen and pleasure seekers unless under benefiting escort. So if the rules are this strict, can you imagine what people are going to say and what people are going to think if it is discovered that Lucy is running around at night on her own in her nightgown? They regard they will, uh, will regard her as semi-naked. It is not semi-naked by our standards, but again, remember for the, the the audience of the time, this would have been shocking. And it seems in Mina's innocence that her biggest worry is that somebody's going to see her. She doesn't realise um, the, the the significance of what is actually happening. So it's this. Lucy is out on a an erotic adventure. We've got the idea, certainly clear links between sex and death. Um, and she's sleepwalking, and she's semi naked, again, in a nightdress. Um, I'm sure everybody's had that dream of being naked in public. And this is kind of the idea that uh, Stoker is drawing on. People who interpret dreams do believe that the, the being naked in public dream is very common, um, but it's also about our fear of revealing our true selves. The idea that we all wear masks or we all um, have a, a persona that we adopt. Okay, and it's the idea that we will learn a true self. So the implication here is that Lucy's true self is a wanton sexualized being. Mina's major focus, as I've said, is trying to avoid a scandal. She is worried that Lucy's reputation will be ruined because she's wandering around outside. Now, again, remember that um, she's engaged to Arthur. Um, engagement at that time was a very different kettle of fish. Uh, it was a formal contract, hence the engagement ring. And by Lucy behaving in this manner, it would give Arthur the opportunity to pull out of the contract without incurring any loss. And Lucy would have to give the ring back. It would also therefore indicate that from if, if the engagement was broken, she would be unable to find another man to marry, or at least a man with wealth and status, which is what Arthur's got. He's a very advantageous uh, partner. So Mina's very, very worried that if this gets out, uh, all hell will break loose. So she says, luckily, she says, as they go out, there's not a soul in sight. The irony of this is that uh, Lucy has also given up her soul by going out to be with Dracula. When you look at that in a little bit, in a lot more detail, but she is, is foreshadowing that, um, in fact, Mina is too late. As we go on, I, I would like you to find the state, the sentences on the silver light of the moon. I want to do a little bit of close, uh, close textual analysis. So where do we see Lucy? Where is she? Well, she's in the ruins um, of a church. She's in the church. She's in the churchyard. It's It couldn't get any more gothic than that. Um, and she is in the graveyard. And the silver light of the moon struck a half reclining figure, snowy white. Okay, so looking at this on a word level analysis, just a reminder that this is the kind of thing you would also be expected to do under examination conditions, not for every quote you use, but certainly for uh, one or two of them, regardless of the exam board. Um, remember, the moon is representative of the female or the mother. Okay, uh, it's associated with female menstrual cycle, which again is associated with, with birth, childbirth, um, and um, childbearing. It's also associated with um, the tides and control and strength. Note that we've got the phrase half reclining, sorry, uh, half reclining three times in this passage, in this paragraph. Half reclining means to be almost lying down. So the impression we get is the heart, snowy white figure is submissive, acquiescent, passive, is allowing this to happen. 
Snowy white, again, is the idea of purity and innocence and surrender. Okay. The coming of the cloud was too quick for me to see much. So not only do we have alliteration with a harsh C sound, which could, which heightens and builds tension because of its harshness and the implication that something harsh is to follow, but it's also the idea of it's a form of pathetic fallacy because the cloud is overshadowing. It's creating um the idea of being unable to see clearly okay so it's also metaphoric and it's uh, so for shut shadow shut down on light so shadow shut down is sibilance the idea that again it's adding to the eeriness the sound adds to the eeriness of the situation light being a metaphor for goodness is being blocked out and it's being blocked out almost immediately so light or goodness is not even having a chance to feature so the adverb immediately shows us how serious the situation is then this is followed by a but the coordinating conjunction but shows us that there is more to this than just the moon going behind a cloud and it's something dark stood behind the seat so remember Lucy is the white figure who is innocent and pure and she is lying on the seat and something dark stood behind the seat now is the dark literal as in a dark shadow or is it figurative darkness evil okay and it's bending over this so supine figure so again the idea that uh, she's almost being mounted okay it is unsure whether it is a man or beast and that again is is significant because the idea of um, behaving in an uncivilized way is regarded as bestial. Um, animals do not are unable to control their sex drive and therefore um, are, uh, are have sex when um, inspired to do so. Whereas humans are able to control themselves, um, and this is just really shocking. And again. She says, I wanted no witness of poor Lucy's condition. So there is a young girl lying on a bench with a man or beast, not sure, seeming to be mounting her. And Mina's biggest concern is that I wanted no witness of poor Lucy's condition. Again, highlighting the Victorian etiquette and modesty. OK. Mina is completely and utterly innocent. She does not realize what is happening and we've got this the whole way through this passage we've got this uh, constant uh, linking of opposites we've got the white figure and the figure in long and something long and black and again the idea of half reclining and we've got um, him having a white face and red gleaming eyes now the white face and red gleaming eyes is, rings alarm bells for the reader because we know that Jonathan described Count Dracula as having white face and gleaming eyes, red gleaming eyes. Please note, nobody else in the text knows this. None of the characters know this. We are the only ones who've been privy to Jonathan's journal. So therefore, it's again the sense of creating a sense of tension through the use of dramatic irony because we know something that the characters don't. Okay, so Mina has no clue how she is going to protect her friend. She She's not sure what to do. She's not even sure if it's a man or a beast. Um, and she really is unaware of the danger that the situation poses. Okay, so the danger is not only um, Lucy's... Uh, Lucy's um, reputation, but also physically the idea of death. Okay. So what has happened is she has pretty much witnessed um, the sexual interaction between Stoke, which Stoke has described between Dracula and Lucy. OK, so we've got this here where she says, I bent over to see that she was still asleep. She was breathing in long, heavy gasps. She pulled the collar of her nightdress around her throat and she gave a little shudder. So. One step at a time here. Mina bends over Lucy. All right. And sees she's still asleep. Stoker allows Lucy the excuse. So gives her excuse to not be in control. 
she was asleep. Reminds us again of when Jonathan submits to the vampire's woman in chapter three. So she is not in control. Instead, while she sleeps, she is ha having he this episode of very heavy breathing. So it suggests sexual arousal and maybe even orgasmic pleasure or ecstasy. Mina does not realize that this is what it represents. She is too innocent. Lucy also pulls at the um, nightdress to cover up the holes in her neck. Why does she do this? Is she ashamed? Maybe the heavy breathing and the gasps are because of the pain in the neck. Or maybe, again, um, she is reliving or redreaming um, the encounter with her dark lover. Again, Mina does not realise what is going on. She does not realise the, the, the depth of the situation. So I think although Stoker wants us to realise that Lucy is a, a flawed character, which she is, uh, uh, hence why he paints her as so frivolous, and, and, but we do pity her. We feel very, very sorry for her. Okay. So when she goes off in the middle of the night, she's wearing her white nightgown. Okay. We are reminded, therefore, that she's still a virgin and that she is a soon-to-be bride. She's going to be marrying Arthur. Remember that white again represents surrender and purity and innocence and goodness. On the other hand, Dracula it represents or symbolizes the darkness and he could be regarded as a physical shadow as well as a metaphorical shadow over Lucy's chastity. So the idea that she goes out in a white nightgown represents her going out in a wedding dress and she's going out to meet her, her Dracula who is her, her bridegroom and they um, meld and the sucking of the blood is the, the, the equivalent to the loss of her virginity. So, um, and so therefore, the whole idea is the association between sex and death and excitement. So there seems to be quite an, a link there. So the telltale marks on Lucy's neck, which I would like to just remind you are traditional signs of sexual experimentation in teenagers. Um, teenagers are stupid enough to give one another hickeys. But Mina doesn't realize this because of her innocence and um, her lack of experience. So the two women are clearly delineate, delineated at this point or divided from this point. So Lucy is a sexualized, highly sexualized being and Mina is not. And in fact, Mina is so, so um, uh, modest that she... She, she balks at the idea of walking barefoot in public. It was a Victorian no-no to have your bare feet on display in public. And she is so worried about that, uh, purely because she is unaware of the significance of what she has just witnessed. Okay, so again, very sexual, um, very erotic, uh, almost pornographic idea um, and uh, Mina is so innocent so she gets her she gets Lucy home and nobody sees them but she decides that she's not going to tell anybody I thought it wiser to do so she thought thinks it's better to he keep everything hidden and concealed so this just draws attention to the theme of concealment and secrecy and the consequences of concealing um, events and keeping things secret. So by concealing what has happened, Mina becomes an accomplice, um, but to the, to the story. So the fact that she's also out and about on her own trying to rescue Lucy could get her into a spot of bother. Um, she is so worried that the message will be distorted, but ironically, of course, by her retelling the story, the whole message is distorted as well. Okay, and bearing in mind, what is she doing out at night on her own in her nightgown? She too could be tarred with the same brush. The next day, they speak of what has happened 
and um, we realize that Lucy has two sharp uh, pinpricks and we again are reminded um, of uh, the, the fact that, that, that her neck has been bitten and impaled. Uh, so again, it's the idea of thrusting, impalement, uh, and again, very sexual. So she's, she locks Lucy in her bedroom and she secures the key. And she says, I do not expect any trouble tonight. Absolutely. Every moment of relief we know is going to be followed by a relapse into further concern. So the next day, of course, the 12th of August, the diary entry starts with my expectations wrong. So she's awoken again in the middle of the night and Lucy trying to escape again. And, and when, when Lucy talks about this a little bit later, she says, his red eyes again, they are just the same. The implication being, therefore, that Lucy has actually encountered Dracula before that night that Mina managed to save her or managed to go and collect her is not the first um, collaboration, shall we say. As we go through this, or as you go through Mina's um, journal, please note that there is a direct contrast between the beautiful scenery and his dearest events, and the idea that um, even in such beauty, something awful can uh, be bubbling beneath the surface. And again, it's the idea of concealment. So beauty and calm used to conceal the evil that lurks beneath. Okay. Um, Again, there's also quite a lot of focus on religious ideas, churches, lights, etc. Note the setting. It's all very, very gothic. Um, again, we've still got the idea that um, Lucy uh, is trying to escape and it's very reminiscent of Jonathan, except in this case, she is not escaping the vampires. She's trying to escape to the vampire. So it's just, again, something to look at and pay attention to. On the 15th of August, she talks about how Lucy was languid and tired, but they discover that Arthur's father is better. Because now remember, this has been, it's been, it's very handy that Arthur's father is unwell. So Arthur is now away and um, Lucy is on her own and not protected by Arthur. So we've got Arthur's father, who's unwell. We've also got Lucy's mother, who tells Mina she has her death warrant. In other words, Lucy's mother realises she is on her last legs and she will be dying soon. So we've got this interestingly, all very magical, but the, Arthur's father falling ill, Mrs. Weston realising she's going to die, are all very magically linked to the approach of, or the uh, arrival of Dracula. Again, the characters are unaware of this. We, the reader, know that he is getting closer and closer to London. The closer he gets to London, the, um, the more situations fluctuate. So we've got Arthur's dad getting ill. We've got Mrs. Weston being sick. We've got Rainfield escaping and running amok. So all these things seem to happen and become more and more intense the closer that um, Dracula is getting to England. And of course, Lucy and Mrs. Weston therefore become victims of this horror of his imminent arrival. So we get the impression here that he's uh, Dracula is not just a vampire. He is more than an evil presence affecting just a few people. He seems to symbolise total social disruption and chaos. So if, and what Stoker is trying to say is that if he's not stopped, he will destroy Victorian society. My question then to you is, can Dracula be regarded as an extended metaphor for something else? Perhaps um, the influx of immigrants or the influx of foreigners or something along those lines. Again, something you could argue. Um, 
Again, as we go through this, though, please note how Dracula is in complete contrast to Mina and Lucy. He's described as pale, wearing black, um, with red eyes, whereas the two girls are looked, uh, regarded as they're wearing white, and they're pure, and they're innocent, and they're vibrant. We now have the solicitor's letter, uh, which talks about the boxes, getting the boxes moved, 50 of them, to um, Carfax. Stoker includes solicitors' letters for credit, credibility. Uh, remember, solicitors are known as fastidious and careful, um, and therefore, by putting in these letters and intermingling these letters with the journal entries, because um, the letters are very formal and lack emotion, um, we we are more likely to believe the events. Again, let me draw your mind back to the epigraph at the beginning, which says um, how all of these are genuine. So by having a, we've had journal entries, which are very emotional, followed by solicitors, lawyers, which lack all emotion, um, gives us, a, just as a reminder that if, uh, that all different documents make up this, and that just because there is emotion attached doesn't mean that the document can't be trusted. So again, it's the idea of trying very hard to um, give credibility to Mina and her journal. The, the specific uh, information uh, as to the amounts of money, etc., etc., and the rather boring. Um, it is rather boring, but again, just emphasises how fastidious and um, detail orientated the solicitors are. We then go back to Mina Murray's journal. We're on the 18th of August. Lucy is beginning to recover, and we see this often. She has, um, she does well, then she relapses, then she does well, then she relapses, and every time she relapses, it's far worse than before. Okay, so it talks about how she is in gay spirits and full of life and cheerfulness. She even talks about um, her memories of the sleepwalking. She says, I didn't quite dream, but it all seemed to be real. Okay. She goes on to describe it as a vague memory of something long and dark with red eyes. Okay, so again... Stoker is giving her um, an out because, of course, this was beyond her control. It was not something she chose to do. It's all very vague and misty. She's not quite sure what happened. What she does say, though, that is very frightening is, my soul seemed to go out from my body. Now, this is very alarming, and neither Lucy nor Mina are aware of the implications, but it links back to the image of when she was reclining on the bench being mounted by a man or beast. And it's the idea that it's too late. Your soul, if you sell your soul to the devil or give your soul up, you are going to spend eternity in purgatory. And it's the idea that Lucy has given her soul over. She has given her, not only her body, but also her soul over to Dracula. And Dracula is now her master. And again, reminiscent of Renfield. And we'll look at that in a little bit. But clearly... Despite this, Mina is um, is a devoted friend. Not only is she a devoted friend, but her devotion to her fiancé is very evident when she gets a letter from Sister Agnes. Um, so the letter from Sister Agnes tells us that Jonathan has clearly been successful in his escape. He managed to get out we will never, ever, ever find out how, which is just a question that always remains in the background. So, yes, he has managed to escape, but he is not strong enough to write. And he has what she calls violent brain fever. In other words, he is suffering emotional and mental trauma. It's probably PTSD after what he's experienced. So he's safe, though, because he's been cared for by nuns. Now, again, she it's, it's quite interesting because where is the safety and security? Where is he protected? Inside the church. OK, not necessarily just a church, but in an abbey. And he's been looked after by nuns. Now, nuns, 
this and this is going to be a little bit important uh, is important a little bit later and again we look at Renfield but according to the Bible Christ is the bridegroom the church is the bride of Christ and it's the idea that we want uh, that, that the church should want to please the bridegroom at a, and do everything in honor of the bridegroom so when we give ourselves to Christ or when we are um, become Christians we do everything he asks and we want to be the best that we can be for him we would like to be the bride and when nuns or when 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 people take a, a vow to become a nun or to become a monk I suppose they become referred to as the brides of Christ they give up they forego a life in society and they marry Christ obviously metaphorically and figuratively rather than literally but they devote themselves to Christ so the fact that he is being looked after by nuns who are wedded to the church and wedded to, to, to Christ and he is safe is the exact opposite of what's happened to Lucy Lucy is married to the Antichrist based on the last interaction that they've just had where she's given her soul to the devil Antichrist please is not it just means the opposite of Christ so she is married to the opposite of Christ and her life is threatened again just a little bit interesting to think about we then move on and we have now we're peppered with dr seward's diary and again it's the link is uh, of religion is running through this so not only have we had things happening in in churchyards but we've had uh, exploring the idea of nuns and brides of christ and now we have dr seward who is a man of science but is not an atheist okay now interestingly okay what you need to understand is that a doctor believing in God as creator would have seemed odd or might may seem odd to you a lot of scientists do not believe in God because they believe in science so this did start to become a lot more apparent during the 1850s when Charles Darwin published his origin of species by means of natural selection and the publication of this and the ideas he put forward certainly divided the ideas of religion and science and many doctors and scientists became agnostic which is not atheist it just means there is they don't believe there's a God at all so my I believe that Seawood is is the exploration because Seawood is a man of science but still has some kind of faith he seems to vacillate between believing um, and being skeptical and unwilling to believe um so the point i think i'm trying to make here is that he is a man of lapsed faith because if he had um if if, if whenever he comes up against something that he cannot explain using science anything that obviously dracula does like uh, you know move into change shape and, and morph and things then he returns to faith so he seems to be a person who um, has lapsed in his Christian walk um, and it takes something this serious and this weird for him to to reclaim his his beliefs I think this is also evident that Stoker is going to his plans on developing the character of Seward because basically he's, he's a really good person he's just you know he's just had a dip in faith so we realized from his diary now on the 19th of August that he's not an atheist or agnostic um, and because he talks about his his thoughts on um, God and madness and men so what's happened is there's been a sudden change in Renfield he's become very excited and he's sniffing about and when um, Seward goes to talk to him he says I don't want to talk to you don't count now the master is at hand now constant use of the reference of master firstly we uh, and the fact that he's sniffing like a dog uh, it's always a dog and his master but Christ is also referred to as Lord and master 
So again, it's a subversion of Christian ideas. So um, he, Seward says that the attendant thinks that uh, Renfield's suffering from religious mania. Um, and he says, well, this is a problem because, of course, when strong people are suffering from religious mania, they can be very, very dangerous. Um, and what does he do? He goes to visit Renfield. It keeps checking on Renfield. Um, and his attitude to me was the same as to that of the attendant. In his sublime self, feeling the difference between myself and attendant seemed to him as nothing. So he able to recognize the difference. He is so focused on um, his own importance. And he says he looks like religious mania and he will soon think he himself is God. So it's the idea that he, he you see, he despises the fact that Renfield's madness has religious roots, almost like the idea that it's an excuse. Um, so often when, for example, when people now in modern society use religious and religion or specific religion, religious ideas, and they subvert them as an excuse to do horrific acts. And he's looking at it from this idea, the idea that he's manipulating religion and faith and believes himself to be a god. He says, these infinitesimal distinctions between man and man are too paltry for an omnipotent being. How these madmen give themselves away, the real God taketh heed, lest a sparrow fall, but God, created from human vanity, sees no difference between an eagle and a sparrow. So he's, his statement points out that he is very well aware that Renfield is not alone um, and that many people do not believe in God or they create themselves um, to be a god. Now, as you just look at that last line, that um, the real god ha um, taketh heed lest a sparrow fall, the language is, it's taking an idea from the Bible. So the, the language is biblical, but it's quasi-biblical language because it's not quite a direct quote. It is more... Um, uh, a link and it's the the idea that it's not quite the language is not quite accurate but it, it, it evokes men's ideas of of religion and biblical language in the reader um we go on to say the bride maidens rejoice the eyes that wait the coming of the bride but when the bride draweth nigh then the maidens shine not to the eyes that are filled Pretty much, it's the idea that a bridesmaid, it looks beautiful until the bride arrives on the scene and she is therefore then pales in because the bride is the most beautiful person there. And it's the idea of settling for second best. OK, now what we've got to remember is that although we've been spending time reading Mina's journal and witnessing the events with Lucy, Seward doesn't know what's going on there. The last contact he would had with Lucy was when he asked her to marry him and she turned him down. Instead, she marries or has accepted the marriage proposal of his friend, Arthur. So the implication is that Seward is second best. He is the bridesmaid and Lucy and Arthur is the bride in this kind of idea that as soon as Lucy sees Arthur, she doesn't even bother looking at Seward. Now, because he's only just been rejected by Lucy, this really upsets him. So this is why he cannot sleep because as he says, I'm weary tonight and low in spirits. I cannot think, but think of Lucy and how different things might have been. So anything associated with marriage, the language of marriage is always going to make him think about Lucy. So what does he suggest he's going to do? He says, well, if he can't sleep, he's going to be taking some chloral hydrate or the modern Morpheus. And then, of course, there's the chemical um, uh, formula for it. So Stoker is, could be suggesting, perhaps, that he, Seward is addicted to chloral hydrate, which was a popular drug at the time and was um, doctors could easily access it. Um, on the other hand, just He's also showing that how contemporary this novel is and how Seward is on the cutting edge of medical um, technology and medical ideas and um, weight treatments. Because, of course, the chloral hydrate was 
developed specifically to deal with insanity. So um, Seward's private asylum is therefore clearly very, very um, uh, modern and and aware of um, modern techniques. Okay. Renfield then escapes and they find him in the grounds of Carfax. All right. And they close in on him and they hear him yelling or having a conversation. So it sounds like the way the way it is described, it sounds like Renfield is having a conversation with God because he talks about, I'm here to do your bidding, God master. I'm your slave. You will reward me. I shall be faithful. I've worshipped you long afar. Now you're here. I wait your commands. Um, I will do your bidding. So it sounds like he is looking forward to the arrival of his lord and master, which is Dracula, but is again um, inverting Christian ideals, which we believe, or Christians believe, that um, the master, lord and master is, is Christ and they await his second coming. Um, it describes him as a selfish old beggar who thinks of the loaves and fishes even when he believes he is in a real presence. So the loaves and fishes, remember, is Christ's um, miracle when he feeds the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves. And he says the implication is that the way Renfield is speaking to his master is paltry. He is focused on the little things instead of looking at the bigger picture. Instead of being aware that he is in the presence of a god, he is focusing on um, little things like saying, please don't forget me, don't forget me. Okay. The real presence is reference to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so um, in the Eucharist, the, the blood and the wine, when Christians had take communion, um, when they they eat the um, eat the wafer and they drink the wine, the, bo the blood and the body of Christ, um, the Holy Spirit is present with them, um, and it's the idea that every time the Eucharist is done, the Holy Spirit is there, and He is called the real presence. So by using the real presence to describe Dracula. It, the suggestion is it's pervert, he's a perverted Holy Spirit and this whole scene is the perversion of Catholic communion. So Renfield is captured and they start put him in a straight waistcoat and he is being dragged away and he says, I shall be patient, master, it is coming, coming, coming. Right, so he's restrained. And he really doesn't seem to, he, he, he's quite happy to be enslaved and bound in a, a shirt waistcoat, which in modern psychological terms would suggest sadomasochistic fetishism. But um, so my question is, is it because Renfield is like that, that he is open to Dracula's suggestion or was he normal and Dracula has made him like this? But his restrained excitement is... Um, also has is a double entendre it's also clearly very sexual so the master's coming yay 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 but the idea of it's coming 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 is reference to ejaculation so again the link between dracula and sex and death okay so i think it's important to note that throughout this chapter stoker has paralleled lucy's eccentric behavior and rainfield's insanity so why? Both escape caretaker, Lucy escapes Mina, um, Renfield escapes the asylum and Seward, and both wander around in their pyjamas, which is something that you didn't do according to Victorian etiquette. Both are also drawn to Dracula. Okay. Ironically, though, I think um, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, at the end of it, it's Seward who cares for both Mina, uh, sorry, Lucy and Rainfield, and yet understands neither of 